Welcome to the Massachusetts School of Law Educational Forum. Historically, many women's issues have been considered outside the scope of the human rights movement. These issues include sexual mutilation, trafficking of women, rape, domestic violence, and polygamy. In the hour that follows, we will discuss the denial of basic rights to women, the alarming brutality in some countries against women, and the blatant abuse and or the discrimination against women, especially in certain third world countries. Joining me to discuss these and other issues, Dr. Nada DeVore, an economist. Welcome, Dr. DeVore. Cynthia Renlo, a professor of government at Clark University, where she is also on the Women's Studies faculty. Thank you for joining us, Cynthia. And Jessica Newworth, one of the founders and current president of Equality Now. She is a lawyer and has worked for Amnesty International in various capacities, and she has also worked in the United Nations. Delighted you're here, Jessica. And Nancy Dorsonville. And Nancy is looking at gender-based violence in the Haitian community. Thank you for joining us, Nancy. And I'm Diane Sullivan, a professor at the Massachusetts School of Law. Ladies, I'd like to ask you, does the absence of women on boards in ministries and in politics translate into a lack of concern over the rights and the needs of women? Cynthia? Oh, I think it absolutely does. I mean, I, I've, I've noticed, and I'm sure all of us have too, sometimes all it takes is one woman to be in the room and the conversation changes. I mean, the kind of uh, cavalier dismissal of certain topics can't, if the woman has some consciousness, if the woman has been chosen by the men in the room because she doesn't have any consciousness, then in fact the conversation doesn't change. I don't know what you all Nada? have found. No, I think that's what we see in the third world countries. We've had women leaders from um, India has had a prime minister. And uh, by the fact that she did not have a gender consciousness, though there was lip service to saying women and women's rights, what actually happened was not really a promotion of women's rights. It's always interesting to us here in the United States to think of these other countries that have had women leaders and then yet to look at what has happened to women's rights in those countries, which is virtually nothing. Well, it depends. I mean, Gro Brundtland in Norway actually changed a country's agenda because she actually came up with a lot of women's support. I think it really depends whether you're talking about um, Sri Lanka or nor I mean, it depends, you know, which country and which political system yeah, and which true. woman. Well, yeah. I think also, I mean, one, one is not enough. And mm -hmm. we have to move from tokenism to genuine equality. And um, it's not just a question of concern. I think it's a question of opportunity for women. Mm -hmm. And that historically women have been excluded and discriminated against in these power structures. And so you feel the effects of the absence of women, but also you're denying women an opportunity that they have a fundamental right to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's also important that when the women are put forward that they are allowed to really bring forth what is the agenda, not only for women's issues, but how those intersect with the general human rights. Good point. Because sometimes women are there and by virtue of the fact that they are constrained to only addressing gender issues, in a way, they minimize the value and the interrelatedness of women's issues, which in effect deny everybody their human rights. Excellent point. Mm -hmm. Jessica, let me ask you, is there an international bill of rights for women? Yes. Uh, the United Nations Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women is commonly thought of um, as the International Bill of Rights for Women. It's a United Nations treaty. and it's referred to uh, more in more short form as CEDAW, commonly known by that name, and it's been signed and ratified by virtually every country in the world, unfortunately, with the glaring exception of the United States. Oh, how shameful. How, how is that so? It's disgraceful. Well, <laughs> the convention was signed by President Carter in the late 70s, and it's been languishing in the Senate ever since. It's a two-thirds majority vote required of the Senate to ratify the treaty, and they, they just haven't been able to do it. And so the United States is, is really alone pretty much in the world mm -hmm. in that respect. And it's, it, it makes it very difficult for those of us who are committed to the rule of international law to say anything. When what our can we women do here to get that passed? Well, Equality Now is part of a campaign for the ratification of CEDAW. And anyone can join that campaign. And we're hoping if we can just mobilize enough public pressure on the Senate, we can really um, 
move on from this shameful situation. Oh, it's got to be mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. Let's begin today's discussion first by discussing female sexual mutilation. I wonder if I might ask you, Nada, how widespread is the practice? It's within uh, Arab and African countries. It's fairly widespread. There are estimates saying that 80 to 115 million women are subject to female genital mutilation. Wow. Why is it done? Well, it's considered to be part of the rites of passage. Um, it is an element of the rites of passage that young girls go through to achieving womanhood. And why the specific operation is done has many different meanings in different societies. Mm -hmm. And maybe Nancy could elaborate. Well, part of it is um, a public health issue that uh, the women are, are seen as having to be um, more hygienic oh and less um, sexually active. So it, it has to do with the repression of their libido. And, um, but so let me just ask you, is this to prevent sexual desire of women? Um, yes, and to not just desire, but to prevent enjoyment of, of the sexual act. Um, and, but the repercussions, psychological and physical, are far-reaching because in the process, a lot of women die, a lot of women um, remain emotionally scarred. Um, later on, when they are of reproductive age, there are many um, medical problems that ensue from childbearing. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it's not just, I mean, it's a rite of passage that stays throughout their lifetime. And just about every milestone in their development is impacted from having had that particular operation, from engaging in sexual relations, from bearing children, and from and their, the dynamic between their, themselves and their own children later on. So Hillary Clinton was correct when she stated that this process is a violation of basic human rights. Absolutely. It's important, though, to realize that it wasn't Hillary who dreamed up that concept. <laughs> but, but to give her credit, she's been listening to women in Africa and um, in the Middle East um, and has really taken on board the lessons and she's lucky to have a certain kind of position in the world and what she says is maybe listened to by a wider you know, range of people than others. But she isn't the one who came to this knowledge. Um, she Good really point. has been taught by <laughs> feminists mm -hmm. in these countries. Let me ask you this. Is the mutilation process like being raped in that it brings shame to the recipients so that women are not willing to talk openly about it? Jessica? Well, no, I, I think uh, many young girls are socialized to be quite proud of, of the procedure and fortunately things are changing and there are many groups working at the grassroots level in countries around Africa and in immigrant communities where the practice persists to change the consciousness of the health issues concerned and you know the underlying purpose of the, of the practice which is really I think important to to put this practice in the range of human rights violations against women because it's a form of violence that's used against women there are many forms that serve the same purpose of subjugating women and controlling their sexuality. So we could look at lots of different practices. This is one extreme practice, but um, I think that uh, as people become more aware of the reality of what it means and what impact it has on, on their health, what uh, we're seeing is rapid change. Are African countries trying to eliminate this practice? Yes, in fact, recently Senegal just outlawed um, FDM. Wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful. Yes, and, and, and has Egypt too, I think. Yes. Banned it. Yeah. Um, increasingly, more and more countries, mm -hmm. um, people are aware. I know in Nairobi, there, there's been a, a big movement. I met mm -hmm. some women in Beijing who were, I mean, that was their platform, mm -hmm. you know, to have that eliminated. Mm -hmm. But it's not just e elimination by mm -hmm. the state that's mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is really, it is a practice with, located within the community, within mm -hmm. the religious and social context. And so therefore, it's very important to change the consciousness of mm -hmm. people. You're absolutely and right. So we are, in fact, uh, supporting a, uh, a tremendous in initiative that's happening in Gambia, where there is trying to change the rite of passage, where this particular operation is eliminated 
and developing new rights of passage. Mm -hmm. Is it illegal in the United States? Yep. It is mm -hmm. illegal in the United States, yes. Will political asylum be granted on these grounds? Well, there was a case um, several years ago, mm -hmm. the case of Fazia Kusinja, that set a precedent. Initially, uh, in her case, she was a 17-year-old girl from Togo who fled this practice as well as an involuntary polygamous marriage and she was held in detention in the United States for about 16 months and initially denied political asylum by an immigration judge who felt that this was not the type of practice that merited asylum but his ruling was overturned and a precedent was established in 1996 um, that female genital mutilation does constitute a form of persecution under the law of the United States for refugee purposes however in the many cases, or the cases that, that certainly we've been following since then, what, what we have sensed is a great resistance by the Immigration Service to really embrace this ruling. Mm. So case by case, there's a battle going on, and mm. many women who are trying to protect themselves or their daughters yeah. from this practice are having a difficult time with political asylum procedures here. The last question I want to ask on this topic is what can we do to bring about worldwide change? Is there anything that can be done? Well, I think we have to be supportive of women who are working in these particular countries. I mean, I think what we've learned, at, and American women have learned it the hard way over the last 20 years of making a lot of mistakes of imagining, oh, American women are so liberated and they are looking at the benighted practices in other countries and will go and sort of spread the good word. And, you know, that was a disastrous approach and it was quite an ignorant approach. And so I think now what women in this country need to do is become informed and mm -hmm. listen as to who they can support in mm -hmm. local countries. And there's so much organizing now, mm -hmm. um, as Nancy said, that there are plenty of ways to become um, active in support of local mm -hmm. groups in those countries. And yes. where it is necessary then to help formulate the international pressure mm -hmm. you know, to mm -hmm. assist right. the women in their efforts in their own countries. But there should not be a dictation of yes. this is right, this is wrong. But I think we should underscore the tremendous need for financial resources in this area. It's, a, it's an area that's been hugely underfunded when you look at what type of intervention is required to change the mm -hmm. practice. You're talking about projects that are successful because they go out to the village. The, you know, they're, they're development style interventions that are very costly and there's, there's just not nearly enough funds to support the really excellent projects that there are around the continent. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that's important is, is to look at, as, as you said, um, the cultural context that allows something like that to be significant and sustained in a society. And as Jessica said, it, it requires enormous amount of funding yeah. because um, not only, it, it's not just dictating, it's mm -hmm. not just replacing, it's understanding what does it mean as a rite of passage, what does the rite of passage mean within that culture yeah. and how that can be modified to really celebrate and honor this person's participation as a full member of that society. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a time that's used for ex exchanging goods mm -hmm. between people because it's, it's within a, a, a festive environment and so there is an economic component, not only for the participants in it, you know, the village. Correct. And, but also the status of the elders who perform that right and their education and the understanding of what it means to them not to have that as their role and as right. their legacy within that society. Excellent point. Has to be really looked at in order for all these interventions to converge and, and make it really meaningful so that it's not perceived as a loss, it's not perceived mm. as something that's being taken from the young girl or from the elder who gave that to that young girl right. as her gift. Mm. Let's move our discussion to trafficking of women. The New York Times reported that it costs merely $250 to probably $500 to be able to buy a person in China. The Nation reports that in India, child prostitution as young as nine costs $2. As I understand it, Thailand is dependent upon forced prostitution. Don't laws and treaties exist to protect women from this type of trafficking activities? Jessica? Well, there is uh, a UN convention that, that's quite, uh, it's quite an old convention on suppression of trafficking 
um, that specifically obligates governments to take measures to stop the exploitation of women um, for these purposes. Unfortunately, governments have, uh, have allowed these practices to continue, and in many cases, you find in trafficking a lot of border control issues where clearly people are being moved across borders and uh, transported, and so there has to be some level of complicity there. Um, so I think what, what one of the real challenges is to get a little bit more political commitment to stopping this practice. It's a very lucrative practice. There's a lot of corruption involved, mm -hmm. and those are big challenges. But I think mm -hmm. if we're willing to take them on with regard to drug trafficking, we should certainly be willing to take them on with regard to protection of You would of think so, beings. wouldn't you? Yeah. Cynthia, let me ask you, is a universal problem, does it include the United States? Oh, yes. And in fact, I mean, it includes the United States in several ways. I mean, one of the primary ways is the U.S. military around its overseas bases. Not every base. It really depends on the local government's own concerns. But around most U.S. bases overseas, there is a prostitution industry, and the prostitution industry um, commercial um, executives, um, if you want to call them that, the people who make the profit off it, they work hand in glove with the uh, base commanders and the deputy base commanders. If you talk to deputy base commanders, now increasingly more and more women are becoming deputy base commanders. Um, it's one of your steps up in your career in the U.S. military, but mainly men. Um, that's one of your jobs. Your job is to deal with the local chamber of commerce. So it sounds very bland, but the local chamber of commerce around most U.S. military bases overseas um, include uh, the runners of brothels, many of whom in turn take women and girls who've been trafficked. And there's been some attempt by some women in the military and some feminists who uh, watch the U.S. military to try and make that visible. I gave a talk once um, in front of a lot of military people, but I, I, you know, they were good meaning people. I mean, you can't see people as monsters. They were doing their job. And I just said, Look, I know it's hard for you all to face, but do you realize that you work for an organization that has a prostitution policy? And I said, now I know that's hard to accept, but here's the evidence that you all have a prostitution policy. Your, your military doctors um, help enforce the um, compulsory vaginal exams on these women. Um, your base commanders hang women's pictures upside down if they're thought to be HIV positive. You know, you run buses, you have cooperative agreements with local businesses that are in the sex trade. You have a policy. I know Let, you don't want to admit though, that. Let's talk about the sex trade. Where are girls being shipped to? Who's the receiver of girls? Well, they're, we could all name different countries. Um, amongst the, the, and they change. I mean, they change less like where are cars being produced. I mean, this is an industry. Um, the, um, the Netherlands. This is now where countries that are importing right, women. Right, importing women. women. But they're girls, aren't they? They're girls and women. Okay. Girls and women. Um, some countries are both the exporter. This is a terrible way to talk because it sounds like we're talking about sneakers. Um, but um, countries. Well, didn't you bring some type of a chart that you could? Yes, maybe it could, if it came yeah. on the screen, we'll take a look and you can at least see where the men are coming from that go to these countries. Ah, there's the picture. If the viewers will look at the countries in green, that's Canada, the U.S., China, that's a new country in green, South Korea, that's a new country in green, um, Australia, New Zealand, just off the picture there, um, Germany, um, the uh, Scandinavian countries, all those countries in green are where men come from. So that's American men, Canadian men, Chinese men, Australian men, New Zealand men. They're the, they're the men who go to countries for sex tourism usually quite well organized, brochures, airlines, hotel packages, and so on. So all those countries in green, that's where the men go, come from to go to countries that, are, um, that have large prostitution industries. Thanks. Thank you, Cynthia. Nada, let me ask you this. Where do these girls end up? Do they end up in countries, and are they then chained to beds, some of the stories that we hear about, and live the life of a sex slave? Oh yes, in quite a few cases that's what happens. Uh, in India I know that every year there are around 13,000 girls from Nepal that come into Bombay for prostitution. And they are literally slaves, prisoners in these tiny, tiny rooms. 
uh, where they have absolutely no chance of escape. They may not be chained and beaten every day, but initially they are beaten and chained and fear is instilled because that's essential mm -hmm. to maintain these women. In nowadays we find that from the new, um, the new transitional economies, Russia, uh, all the Eastern European countries, there's a huge trafficking of women that is going to, these women are going to Germany, they're going to the Netherlands, they're going to Japan, they're going to even some of the Southeast Asian countries where there's a demand for white women. And the, what I think is very important for us to understand, we did first start saying that are there treaties and conventions to deal with this problem. I think it's very important to keep in mind that yes, it's very critical to have treaties and conventions and the countries that are receiving should view these women as women who are being uh, violated of their basic rights and not as criminals mm -hmm. because that's right now that's the way they're mm -hmm. being viewed as mm -hmm. illegal immigrants, people who are overstaying their visas, etc. Well then let me interrupt mm -hmm. you for just a moment and I'll, I'll open this up to the floor. If a woman ends up in the United States because she was forced here uh, under some type of a, a, a sex slave arrangement, would she be granted political asylum here? I mean, in fact, one, one of the, the cases that's gotten the most notice here, thank goodness, is um, South Korean women who have married American okay. servicemen. Right. Um, sometimes those servicemen are genuine at the time of marriage, sometimes they are actually quite not genuine, mm -hmm. but the woman thinks she's marrying a, woman, a man who will um, be we'll a faithful, uh, yes, who will mm -hmm. be a good husband. And so she emigrates to this country with that um, uh, military personnel who sometimes stays in the military, sometimes gets out, and either abuses her and so the marriage ends, or she runs away, or he never intended to have a real marriage and really was going to pass her on to some um, prostitution ring once she got here. And those South Korean women now have turned up in raids in New York City, on Long Island, in places like Great Neck on Long Island, I mean, places that are supposedly proper suburbs. I mean, this is not just inner city mm -hmm. things. And oftentimes it's only been when feminist groups in the area have come to the support of these women, given them legal aid and, and uh, psychological counseling and oftentimes financial support, that they are protected mm -hmm. from the really crushing weight of the immigration service, which mainly sees them as illegal aliens who no longer have a sub husband to support her. Jessica, yeah, are you doing work in this area? Yes, I want to go back to Cynthia's point about um, sex tourism, because I think if we're looking for criminality, that, that's where we should be looking, and, and not to focus on these women who really need opportunities. They need economic opportunities. Mm -hmm. They need education. You know, and, and they're, they're either forced by economic circumstances or by sheer physical coercion into these circumstances, which are then promoted by these sex tourism agencies mm -hmm. in a glossy way. And I think we really have to take responsibility for sending these men over. And there are organized sex tours operating, and Equality Now has been campaigning against one in particular, which is based in New York City, called Big Apple Oriental Tours. And they regularly organize tours of men, sex tours, to the Philippines and Thailand, and it's relatively open. And mm -hmm. it's clearly a violation of New York state law, which prohibits the promotion of prostitution. But it goes on. Mm -hmm. For more than two years, we've been calling on the district attorney of Queens County, which is where this company is located, to take action. We've done research. We have um, had some tremendous support from men who have done undercover research for us. We've collected quite a substantial amount of evidence that has been reviewed by lawyers and found to be quite credible to make a case under the law. So there's a lot that people can do right here that will have an immediate impact in terms of stopping this trafficking because it, it's, it's really right in our midst. It's in the back of every single men's yeah. magazine. All you have to do if, you, if you're a viewer and you want to do a little research, pick up the, your favorite hunting magazine, your favorite, you know, um, I mean pick up, you know, <laughs> other magazines and go and back and read the small uh, classified ads and they're classified ads for proxy brides and for they'll be called different kinds of things but they'll be like what's the name of the company in New York? Big Apple Oriental Tours. Big Apple Oriental Tours and there's cherry blossoms and there's mm -hmm. a whole bunch of and so the viewers can go do their own research and
you know, see, if, that this is going and see on. If, they, if they have a box number that's where, near where you live, maybe your local group would like to sort of take it up as an amnesty issue. Or a We have to make it a serious issue because I think what happens with our own authorities is that there's a kind of a wink and a nod going on. Mm -hmm. And if the same type of activity was happening in New York and somebody was sending busloads of men right. to, to a prostitute, Mm -hmm. Tuition house in, in Brooklyn, there would you know there would be some activity, and There'd so why action. shouldn't we care about what's happening to women Absolutely. overseas when we're responsible mm -hmm. for it? My next topic is rape of women. Nancy, as I understand it, is very common in Latin America, rural Southeast Asia, parts of West Africa, to require a rape victim to marry the rapist. In Peru, gang rape members are all exonerated if one of them offers to marry the rape victim. Worse than that, in parts of the, Mar the Arab Middle World, as I understand it, rape is considered sex outside the marriage, so the law allows for whipping or imprisonment, and the culture condones killing or pressuring that victim into suicide. Is any progress being made to end these horrendous practices? Very little, <laughs> unfortunately. And um, not only is there not enough enforcement of the laws, the, the way the laws are set up in many of those countries don't even allow, the, the woman is, is essentially punished for coming forth. So it remains a secret, it remains shameful, and it remains unattended. And the people who are empowered are the perpetrators because the woman has no recourse. Is rape of a woman of woman in these countries also somehow used as a political weapon? Absolutely, and in fact, one of one of the big um, achievements in in the Beijing platform was to make sure that rape became um, accepted as a um, war crime, mm -hmm. which um, I mean it's it's universally known and histor historically known that. Anytime that there are conflicts, one of the major manifestations is raping the women. And yet, um, most, most states don't have any legal statute regulation to really address that. And, and internationally, in fact, I would say there is more that has been done than at the specific local governments. Mm. Um, and, and, and rape is not a crime of passion. It's, it's a crime. It's, it's, a, it's, it's aggression. It's not, um, it, it's, not, it's not about sexual desire. It, it's about um, violence. It, it, it's about hurting. It's about um, subjugating. And, um, and, and the victims are, are further victimized by, by the current um, legislatures in, in most countries, I'm including trying, here. I'm trying yes. to figure out why, why the cultures really think it's the woman's fault. Well, the American culture thinks that too. I mean, until recently. I mean, the you're, 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 a, you know, you're a, a feminist lawyer, you know. I mean, how much persuasion of how many judges and how many prosecutors well, has had a, to go on? And it's been pretty recent. I mean, I can remember when the two words marital rape it sounded like a complete oxymoron. More, In fact, yeah. it was treated like an oxymoron. <laughs> there was no such right. thing. That's right. And mm -hmm. it's only because of women who really, I remember a woman who was called Laura X. Do you remember Laura yeah. X? And I remember she came to our campus and she was in the forefront of having rape in marriage considered a violation of a woman's rights. Mm -hmm. And she was treated like a crazy person. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. she was treated as if she was so far out on the edge as if, Nobody seriously could even um, contemplate. That's that. right, yeah. and, and take mm -hmm. her serious. And it took somebody to have that kind of guts. And everybody here has, mm -hmm. at one point, been treated as if they're a crazy person. Because what mm -hmm. you're trying to do is say the things that are being treated as normal—that is, that woman is an object of her husband or the object of men's desire—that's normal. In fact, it's not only normal; it's good for social order. It's good for tradition. Always in quotes. Um, and to break that down and to say something that is treated as normal is not normal, that makes you sound crazy. Mm -hmm. And so you really, everybody here, but all the people that we've all worked with, have had to take the risk of sounding crazy. Mm -hmm. Well, marital rape is still not legally recognized mm -hmm. in many yes, countries around yes. the world. The remedy for the rape of your wife, which is considered a crime against you, is that you can rape someone else's 
wife who raped your wife. I think that when you look at practices like that, you, you really see the property concept mm -hmm. of women which underlies the refusal to recognize marital rape because once you're married, you have a right to this woman in any way you want. So mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense to, to, to the systems that you would have something like marital rape. Let's change topics again. Nada, I'd like to talk about domestic violence. It seems to me that widespread violence against women is still one of our most crucial and pressing issues. Your reaction to that? Oh, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> it is. Does uh, it plague all societies? It plagues all societies. It's endemic in every society. See, one of the problems is that we do not really have uh, very systematic empirical data to say one in two women is, faces domestic violence. But the existing data that we do have shows that between a quarter to 50% of women um, worldwide have faced domestic violence at some point in their life. Mm -hmm. So that means almost one in every other woman does face domestic violence across mm -hmm. cultures, across income strata, across educational levels. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's universal. Mm -hmm. Do most countries have laws prohibiting domestic violence? Not many have laws prohibiting domestic violence. Um, one is that one thing that has happened is that the, in Latin America and uh, the United States, there was an inter-American convention on violence against women. So as a result of signing that convention, Quite a few of the Latin American countries have begun to put on legislation uh, provisions against domestic violence. I was just going through, a, uh, there was a review of 17 countries, basically Latin American countries in South America and North America do have some provision. Will the laws be enforced, do you believe? Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's much. There's quite a bit of, uh, what is that phrase? That the cup between, uh, the slip between the cup and lip. <laughs> it's huge. But yeah. uh, domestic yeah. violence laws, specific laws addressing domestic violence can be very helpful in terms of bringing the issue to the attention of law enforcement. But really, any, most countries in the world, if not all countries, have assault laws which prohibit assault. And domestic violence is clearly a form of assault. So I think the, the real challenge for us is how to, how to get law enforcement to work for women. And if I could just go back to the point you made at the very beginning, I think it's not just about women in corporate boards. We need women everywhere. We need women in the police force. We need women in the judiciary so that when women come in, there will be some more understanding of what they might be going through, some more willingness to believe something they say. And that right now, I think women feel like everything's stacked against them when they go to the police. Mm -hmm. And the police really are siding with the person who abused them. That's something you hear commonly all over, including in this country. And so laws are helpful, but they're just the first step. We need a whole reorientation of, of, of law enforcement in order to, to address this problem effectively. Although there are some of my colleagues who would, who, who would argue that practice in the domestic violence area that the cards are really now stacked against men here in the United States. That's not necessarily so. I mean, I, I think it, it's true, as Jessica said, it's important to take a step back because fundamentally there is a, an impression that there is a clear demarcation between private and public mm -hmm. and domestic violence, um, conjugal, familial, is perceived as being private. And one of the important angle to look at is the laws about assault and, and applying them. But the, one of the drawbacks of that is that domestic violence is not necessarily exclusively um, corporal violence. You know, there is mm -hmm. um, psychological battering, mm -hmm. there is omission of um, sex, money, um, there is threat, um, you know, there is control. I mean, fundamentally, it's, it's again, the whole subjugation and control. And it, it's a re-education and, and an understanding of how violence is perceived by the person who is experiencing it. You know, a lot, a lot of the violence doesn't necessarily start with corporal violence. Mm -hmm. it, it's, very often um, verbal assault. What do you tell the callers when they call in and they say, my husband has beat me, my boyfriend has threatened me? What do you tell them to do? 
We try to explore um, case by case what are the options for that person, where that person is. A lot of times at the beginning there is a lot of denial. People will say, well, he's really good. It's because he's drinking. Or um, he only did this one time. And, and it's basically talking through with the person and listening to them and letting them hear themselves how pained, how shamed, how scared they are by what happened. And looking at what resources they may have within their community, within their family, within themselves. Are they ready to leave? Are they ready to seek counseling? Are they ready to um, take legal action? And, and what are the implications of that, whether they are documented or undocumented? You know, we were talking about FGM as a reason for asylum. What does that mean? Um, along ethnic groups and along cultural groups, what does it mean to go outside the family unit and report something that is perceived as private? So um, it's, it's really helping the person explore what the implications are for them within their um, sociocultural economic context and, and developing a plan of action and basically ensuring that they are safe, as mm -hmm. safe as they can be. And that really, I mean, that's what is lacking in a lot of third world countries is this kind of integrated multiple response. Mm -hmm. It's either you have a criminal law and you say police, judges, etc., where many women, in fact, don't want to go that mm -hmm. route and they don't have an option. Or it's counseling where you say you have to adjust, you have to reconcile with the family. So there are only two extreme options, That's and right. we need this. This is the critical need in third world countries. I think the long-term solution mm -hmm. to all of these problems of violence against women lies in equality. I think if women can be empowered and feel empowered, all kinds of things become possible in terms of their protection of themselves, their promotion of themselves that, that just aren't possible regardless of the law or any other structures around them, that there's a psychological dynamic that you certainly see in domestic violence of self-esteem and, and all kinds of issues that would prevent people from using mm -hmm. maybe whatever resources there are available yep. to them. So it's a mm -hmm. complicated process. And that notion of empowerment is about being treated as a whole person, which means a person who deserves to become literate, right? A person who deserves to have skills to earn their own independent income, a person who can rent without anyone else signing, mm -hmm. um, a person who can travel and not be seen as alone if you're not with a man, a person who can go into a tavern or a bar with a group of other women and not have a man come up and say, well, what are you girls all doing here alone? Mm -hmm. I mean, right? <laughs> because that's treating you as if you aren't a whole person. You're only a part of a person if you're not accompanied by a man. And so that whole package of things that end up sounding like being an autonomous person, a person who is whole and therefore deserving of rights. And that's very, it sounds so easy to say, right? But when you get down to the nitty gritty like this, it, it's very hard to live. Mm -hmm. Let's turn our discussion, if we might, to polygamy. How do women affected by polygamy regard it? Nada? Well, um, I've looked at some uh, studies that have tried to understand polygamy, in, in, especially in African societies. And it's a very mixed bag, as, as many of the other issues that we've been talking about. Because polygamy, the having numerous wives in a compound, sometimes is very helpful to women. They share a certain amount of the, the burden of work, of field work and housework. There's a, some network of solidarity and support that comes with having many other women in the compound. There are also other problems of being uh, treated as the second wife, as you know, not worthwhile, etc. So it's a very mixed bag. I, I won't say that polygamy. We would like to say that polygamy is perceived as horrible by all women who are in a polygamous situation, but I don't think that's the case. Mm -hmm. I, th I think you have to try to always mm -hmm. look at a practice from the within the context of the restrictions. Um, it exists. So if, if you take a practice like female genital mutilation, you know, you have mothers who are, have to make a choice with regard to their daughters, are their daughters going to get married or not? That that might be a factor that would really make a huge difference in their decision about whether to circumcise their daughters. And the same thing with polygamy is mm -hmm. true. 
It's not as though women can choose not to be polygamous and have other alternatives that might work for someone in this country. So for them, polygamy might be their only way to survive. It might be that recognizing polygamy legally will give them inheritance rights that they otherwise won't have and literally be thrown out with nowhere to go. And so it's understandable that people would support polygamy under those circumstances. But I think those circumstances are the problem, and that's what we have to look at, that women really just, you know, to, to go back to this empowerment as a whole and treating people as a whole person so that if a woman, wherever she is, has the same rights to education when she's growing up, the same rights to employment, you know, the same kind of independence that men have, they might view polygamy quite differently. Um, so I think to say that women support polygamy without explaining some of those other factors in the culture can be very misleading. We have spent a good part of the hour talking about the problems in third world countries as well as problems here in the United States. Let me ask, what can we do to reform some of these problems? And what factors contribute to the difficulty in reforming law as it pertains to women's rights? Nancy? Well, the whole notion of it, the agency of women, the agency to make decisions about themselves, the um, economic, educational constraints that interfere with that agency, with that self-actualization, are what Jessica was mentioning, really the greater barriers to, uh, you can have laws, you, you, you can have statutes, you can have treaties, you can have um, social services, but unless the women and everyone in the society accepts them as whole, um, as autonomous, as capable, as adults, <laughs> um, I mean, many women in, in, in societies are not considered adults, and they're considered minors until they're married. And until those issues are addressed, then women will remain subjugated. Women will remain disempowered. And, and it, it is critical that a, a whole um, plan, a multi-layered plan is looked at um, that takes into consideration how all those things intersect to either promote or hinder um, the rights of women. Are women in some countries more concerned about basic rights and basic needs that they, they never really stop and worry about women's rights, Jessica? It, <laughs> Nancy, please. No, no, no. I think it's, it's, it's a little bit scary to frame it that way yeah. because mm -hmm. sometimes because of basic survival issues, right. portable water, immunization for their children, their, their own um, nourishment, shelter, and so forth, you know, there is a sense oh, it's more important for them to have food and to, to have health than to worry about civic, social, and political yeah. rights. But to, to borrow from the declaration, it's indivisible. <laughs> you know, it, it's not a matter mm -hmm. of separating whether I'm going to eat or whether I'm going to vote. In order for me to be integrated, in order for those things to be inalienable, they, they cannot be separated. And, and I, I would like to underscore mm -hmm. that it is in the process of realizing these mm -hmm. basic needs that mm -hmm. women really become to come into their own. It, that process of negotiating for meeting those basic mm -hmm. needs, uh, fighting with local structures, uh, regional structures, power structures for having that dis distribution of food or ensuring that, that the environment is mm -hmm. safe. It's in that process that uh, women we have seen in many third world countries have become empowered mm -hmm. and realize mm -hmm. then their rights as an individual. And that there is a close interlinkages between the human rights and development. And that's now the new uh, kind of um, perception that we've now developed. And it's a very important perspective that has come which I would like mm -hmm. to really underscore. Yeah. And it's true in the United States, too. That is, a lot of women who have become feminists have started out being concerned about their children or concerned about the toxic waste dump in their neighborhood. And they didn't start out thinking, oh, I'm on a women's rights campaign. They started out thinking, well, I can't understand why the public health service or my town council hasn't taken this toxic waste dump seriously when it's affecting my family and has 
a mother, I see myself responsible for my family's welfare. And once they are treated like an hysterical housewife, as one woman called them, um, that is quoting a council person or a military base person, once they're treated like, quote, an hysterical housewife, it's amazing the radical change. You think, wait, I'm a citizen. I'm a thinking person. Don't treat me like that just because you see me as a woman and therefore don't think I know how to talk about public affairs. So I think that whole package of involvement in civic life for the sake of basic needs as well as more broad opportunities is something that also occurs right here in the northeast of the United States as well. I think you're right. Jessica? Well, I, th I think, as everyone said, you can't separate basic needs from basic rights. And particularly, you know, in many countries where you see it through the lens of women's issues. It's true generally, of course, but with regard to women, you can see something like education, which is so basic. Mm -hmm. It may be a question of money in a country where there's not enough money for schools. But then even if there were more money, mm -hmm. girls wouldn't be allowed to go to school. And so is that needs or rights? Is it political or economic? It's both. And I think in many... Um, issues related to women's rights, you see that coming together very naturally. In 10 seconds or less, if you would, how can people in the United States lobby to bring about change worldwide? Well, I think uh, we have to mobilize public pressure and we have to build support networks. And, and that's certainly what we've been trying to do. And what we're finding is that there's a global campaign of women's solidarity that's emerging mm -hmm. since, in particular, the Beijing conference in 95. And, and I think people should join mm -hmm. in with that. It's, uh, it's something anyone can do. Anyone can join. Ask every senator, whether they're from your state or not, whether they voted for CEDAW. And ask even if they voted for it, did they push for it in the U.S. Senate? The U.S. Senate is culpable in this. Excellent point. As we close in on the hour, I'd like to share with you what motivated me to do this show. It is the case of a nine-year-old girl, as reported in the Boston Globe, who was starved and beaten to death in her home by her father. The autopsy revealed a hundred broken bones, cigarette burns on her body, and severe malnutrition. Why did this happen? Because under Iranian law, custody was automatically given to the father. The struggle over women's rights in Iran is indicative of a country where laws were made by men for the benefit of men at a price that women shall no longer have to pay. It is not okay to punish women by stoning. It is not okay for women by law to earn half the pay of men. And it is not okay to forbid women to run, to bike, or to swim in public. Can you tell which of these children was not born free? Can you tell which of these children was not born equal? Can you tell which of these children does not deserve to be treated with dignity? We can't either. Human right number one, we are all born free and equal. At the New American College of History and Legal Study in Salem, New Hampshire, you can finish your bachelor's degree affordably and get on the fast track to law school. We teach American history, and you'll receive a rigorous education at a very low cost. The small day and evening classes allow you to interact closely with the distinguished faculty. At the American College of History and Legal Studies, professors don't lecture. Through the discussion method of teaching, you'll be engaged in the issues raised in class. You'll learn to be a critical thinker, a better writer, and a polished public speaker. And you'll be able to compete with anybody in today's competitive marketplace. You can also get on the fast track to law school. Qualified students gain early admission into the Massachusetts School of Law. The new American College of History and Legal Studies offers the junior and senior years of undergraduate education. To finish your bachelor's degree, with the opportunity to start your law degree early, call or visit today. Massachusetts School of Law, legal education that is practical, accessible, affordable, and enjoyable. Offering flexible day and evening classes, full or part-time studies, where candidates are assessed not on the LSAT, 
but their academic and other accomplishments, providing more professional skills training than any other law school in New England. Massachusetts School of Law. Visit us at mslaw.edu. Training students to become successful lawyers and advocates, not just legal scholars. Let us now turn to an interview with an Iranian woman, my colleague, Michael Coyne. With me today is Neely Daria Begi, who is an attorney who had spent half of her time uh, in Iran uh, for a number of years. You were a resident of Iran? I was born there, yeah. I lived there for about 15 years. Um, why don't we take a look at uh, what you dressed like when you were in Iran as opposed to what you look like now? Sure. Now, can you tell us what the purpose of the, the dress code is? Um, it, you have to cover basically your hair, um, your, your face, your hands. Um, you can't have any makeup on, any nail polish on. Um, you, you have to, your full body has to be covered up, up until your ankles. Um, and the purpose is that if you're not married, or if, uh, if you're not married to a man, and if he's not your father, your brother, or your uncle, he can't see you without the dress code, without the scarf and the over. Dress. But what is it designed to prevent? Um, basically, they, in Islam, it's considered the men can't control themselves, and, they, and a woman sh shouldn't do anything to tempt him. So basically, so we have to cover ourselves to prevent them from getting tempted. So, so greater responsibility is placed it's, on the woman. Exactly, because they think a man is just innocent and he can't, you know, he can't control himself. Now, can a woman be forced to marry in Iran? Uh, a, a man can't force a woman to marry him. Her parents can. Let's say if her parents want her to marry a 40, 50-year-old man and she refuses, at that age you really don't have that much strength to go against your parents' wishes. And if she says yes, I'm not so sure at that age she even understands what she's agreeing to. Um, in this country we consider that to be rape. And we don't even think a child that age has the capacity to consent. Um, and what happens is once she does get married and certain, you know, if he's physically abusive towards her or towards the kids, she can't ever get a divorce from him. And even if, let's say, he does let her go, he gets automatic custody of the children. Regardless of how he yeah. may have treated the children during, or the wife during the marriage. Exactly. Regardless, he gets automatic custody and most mothers can't walk away from their children. So what they do is they just sit, you know, in order to protect the kids, they stay in that marriage. And even in a good case scenario where he says you can go and you can take the kids with you, let's say she's 15, 16 years old, at that, at that point she's got three, four kids because there's no birth control. She never finished elementary school, so where can she really go? Um, and let me just ask, we had, when we had talked earlier, you said she may be one of multiple wives. It's permissible to have many wives in a run. You can have four wives, a man can have four wives um, which is for lifetime, what a marriage, what we consider a marriage to be. Every, anything after that is considered to be temporary marriages where it's for a specific amount of time and a certain amount of money, um, but you can have as many as you want. A man can have a as many. A man can have as many as he wants. Because if a woman was to engage in, a, in an adulterous relationship, what would be the penalties for that? Uh, she would get stoned to death. He would get fined. but. A man really never needs to commit adultery because he can have a temporary marriage. Um, so basically, it's a, just a monetary loss either way, if so you look at it. She would be stoned to death. She would be stoned to death. If she does, and, and the thing is, I mean, if she's married and she can't ever divorce her husband, and she decides she wants to have a, you know, an, an outside affair, she risks her life. Um, she also risks her life for violating the dress code. Um, the dress code is strictly enforced, uh, and you you really don't get jailed, you, you get physically punished and there's different forms depending on what you did. Um, they can, it, it ranges from like throwing acid on your face, they can stand on the side of the street and throw acid on your face if you walk by. You, you um, know, you, you said that matter-of-factly and you said that to me earlier when you said it and it struck me as, as how barbaric. It's very barbaric but um, l let me just say the other forms. Another thing they can do is what they do is they, they stand in every block in a bus, they have buses, and the guards stand in every block, and they they just take people randomly in, if for any reason. Um, and you could get either whipped on your hands a hundred times in your back. Um, there's putting you in containers of water with leeches in it, getting your fingers cut off, depending on what it is, and it changes all the time. They you know it, it, one form gets popular over another every three four months, um, and they don't care if you're a child or if you're a pregnant woman or if you're an old lady. And most 
pregnant women don't, can't survive under it. Um, an example is that what they do is they separate the schools, the boys and the girls, and the hours are even different. If from seven to two is boys, and then from eight to three is the girls' schools. And what they do around three o'clock is they um, they they block out the whole street. They stand at the bottom of the street and then they start walking up as we're going down, as the girls are going down, and then they start taking you in. You know, depending on whatever. The dress code violation. Well, yeah, the dress code violation. Even so, and and one time. Um, you know, you could have naturally, you could have like rosy cheeks, or you could have long eyelashes, and, that, and you haven't done anything. Uh, one time when we were walking out, um, a friend of mine, she, she was a beautiful girl, she had these big, like long curly eyelashes, and the guard just grabbed her, started pulling her eyelashes out. And uh, during, you know, while he was doing it, he realized that they're real. And he was like, and then he started, you know, he just continued, he pulled the rest of them out, and he said, you shouldn't even look this pretty, because it just attracts so much attention, you shouldn't even have these eyelashes and just pull them out. Or if, let's say, you have like rosy cheeks, they think you have makeup on, so you might get the acid thrown on your face and you haven't even done anything. Now, boys are treated harshly, as we said earlier as well. Boys are not free from, from this form of punishment or forms of punishment of this sort. Mm, no, they get, basically, with the younger generation, they try to make, they try to enforce it harder, so you, the older ones are more careful, older men. Whereas the younger kids, they're not, they're teenage boys. They want to go out, they want to date girls, they want to look good. Um, so they get punished just as severely. But it's not really to protect them. It's not really a matter of like, because they're trying to treat women better or men better. It's, they just don't want them to have any kind of contact with each other. Now in areas of inheritance uh, or in the court system, the, the treatment of women again is something less than that of a man. A woman, a woman, supposedly her testimony is supposed to be half of a man, but that doesn't really make any sense because if it's always half of a man, she, she's going to always lose. Um, so we might as well just not go to court. I mean, if you're going against a man, you might as well just not go because there's no. Um, let, let's just say one of the one of my friends got married. Um, we were like 12, 13 years old, and her parents married her off to a man, and he used to physically abuse her. He used to tie her up, beat her up first, and then tie her up to a bed, lock the bedroom, take all the phones out every day, and then he would go to work. This went on for like three, four years. After three, four years, she got a chance to like run away. She went to the courts to grant her a divorce, and they said, you need, they sent her right back to him. They, they said that you need four witnesses to say, preferably male witnesses, to say they've actually seen him physically beat you up and lock you and tie you up and stuff, and she couldn't, he had never done it in front of other people, so. This, the judicial system uh, would, is principally controlled by men? Yes. Um, you're a lawyer in this country. Would mm. you have the ability to be that in Iran? Y yeah, yeah, I could practice as a lawyer. You could practice any profession that you want. Um, the goal is to create a society where men and women don't have absolutely no contact with each other. So basically, they need just as many teachers, doctors, lawyers for a woman than they do men, women, lawyers, doctors, that they do for men. So basically, they let you, you know, you can practice, you can work, you can practice, you can go to school. They don't. But your compensation would be half of that of the men. Your compensation is still the same. Again, for the prof because it's a professional field, they want to maintain. They want all. They want women to become doctors. If they say we're not going to pay you as much, then girl, women aren't going to go become doctors. So for that reason, it's not because they real. They have any sympathy for women, or they feel sorry, or you know, they're trying to be fair. It's just because they know they need women to be doing this. Fact or fiction? Can you still have a harem? Yes, of course. In Iran, you can have an harem. Uh, in certain Arab countries, you can't. You're supposed to separate the wives from each other and treat them equally and fairly. Um, in Iran, you can have all, all wives live under the same roof. It's not practiced as much just because it's not practical. Men can't financially support four or five different wives. But it, legally, they can if they choose to. OK, thanks, Neely. Back to you, Diane. I'd like to thank our guests, Nada, Cynthia, Jessica, Nancy, thank you for your time and your insightful information on this topic. And to our viewers, I want to thank you. And I want to suggest if you're interested in joining on this campaign on some of these most pressing issues, please visit the website that you will see showing on your screens. Thank you. And until next time, be well. <laughs>